This is the Door History Podcast, and my name is Naomi Clifford. Here at the door, we like to push the door, open the door, unlock the door, but our aim is to cast some light on hitherto unknown stories of women. Just try and balance things up a little bit. They might not be famous women, but I think you'll be interested in hearing about them. The door. 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 So, we're here having coffee in Lena Augustinson's kitchen. Yes. To talk about women, art, craft, and a lot of subjects around that area. I'm lucky enough to have Diane Goldie here, artist. And Diane, how would, would you want to say something about your practice and what you do? Yes, um, hello. Um, I take fabric and I combine fabric with hand-painted elements and I put it all together in a collage kind of way um, in order to create portraits of the interior of people. Um, if that makes that, sense. That does make sense, and we'll hear more about it as we talk, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Um, we've asked Diane to come along today to expand our conversation on women in history who made art that perhaps has, that has not been seen as art, um, not viewed as proper art, if you like. Mm-hmm. And Diane, hopefully, Diane, you'll share some of your experiences about the resistance you have mm-hmm. met in your career and how you've gone through that and come out the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was going to kick off this conversation with a trip I made to Dublin to the National Gallery of, of Ireland, where I was quite amazed to find amongst the, the beautiful galleries and lots of oil paintings by Gainsborough and Hogarth and um, Fagonard. I found this little wooden box on the wall with a tiny wax figure of a woman inside it. It looked completely out of place, I've got to say. And it set me thinking about why it was in there and who was who was the person who made this rather strange box. And she turned out to be someone called Catherine Andrus, and she was a wax modeller. Um, and you don't see many wax models in art galleries mm. in the Western world, at least. So this is the first when, one. When I was this that made, approximately? Well, uh, she was born in 1728. And I think, um, the I can't remember exactly when the model was made, no, but, but uh, she, I suppose 40 years later, yeah. perhaps. She was commissioned to make it. This It was a portrait of a person um, called Bruce, uh, Rose Bruce, who was the widow of Samuel Bruce, who was a Presbyterian minister in Dublin so she was commissioned this portrait was commissioned so I started to sort of look around the life of Catherine Andrus and she made a life-size portrait of Nelson after he died which is now which was commissioned by the Westminster Abbey trying it was a touristy thing actually because Nelson was buried uh, in a tomb in St Paul's because Westminster Abbey was quite full of heroes but Westminster Abbey rather wanted some of the, the trade that came with Nelson. So they commissioned <laughs> Catherine Andrus to make a life-size portrait, yeah. which Nelson's mistress, Emma Hamilton, thought was the best portrait of him. And she was mm. allowed to move a lock of the hair on the wax figure to the place where she felt it, it should go. Yeah. But she was very pleased with it. Yeah. And it was a rather touching story. But it made me... Um, it, it prompted me to think about how women, the position of women in art, and um, whether their, their, the art they produced, how that was seen. Mm. Um, and it really, I had to come to the conclusion that it wasn't accepted, as, certainly as high art, and that women were more or less excluded from the, wor- the world of high art by their gender. Mm. Um, so I know we were talking the other day, Diane, about this very thing of this this sort of um, fight between craft versus art, yeah. and what women do being consigned, if that's the right word, to craft. Mm-hmm. Well, it was what men do is art, mm-hmm. and um, you told me a wonderful story about um, 
a submission you'd made to a gallery that yeah. was rejected. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a bit Absolutely. more about that? Um, it was a little underground gallery, um, so it wasn't a big prestigious place. And the, the, the guy that runs it is um, generally really sort of open-minded and, and very, um, very liberal and very aware of all kinds of issues around, you know, gender and bias and things like that. Um, he was having um, an open uh, call out for an exhibition called Red. And at the time, I'd been doing a lot of crochet portraits of some of my friends in the performance world. And one of them was a, a, a portrait of, of my friend called Marnie Scarlett, who was a, she's an art piece in herself. And she, she'd made this fantastic latex outfit that was something crossed between a clown and a, a businessman, all in red. And the theme was um, about male ejaculation, which was really, really <laughs> extraordinary. Anyway, she totally inspired me. So I, I, I got out my crochet hook and I, I made this little portrait of her that turned out to be a little dolly of kinds. And it was all red. So I thought, this is a perfect piece. It's kind of subversive. It's quirky. It, it should really fit in with the, with the theme of the, of the gallery and the kind of feel of the place. Plus, also, my, my friend Marnie would, was also exhibiting in that very same exhibition, so I thought, that's a shoo-in. Until I, I submitted it, and I was rejected, with a polite little email saying, I'm really sorry, but that's not the sort of work we, we have at this gallery. And it really, really made me cross, because I thought, why? Because I know if a man had exhibited it, it had submitted that piece they would have got a look in because it would have been seen as subversive. Did he give reasons for why? No. So it was just, it's, it was it was just, just we sort of don't do this kind bottom, of thing. Yeah, we don't do this kind of thing in our gallery. And I thought, well, I don't want to sort of... Okay, I was hurt, obviously. Um, but I thought, let me try again. Let me do a little test. So I thought, what the problem is, it's not my skill. It's the medium I'm submitting it because I'm a woman. And uh, so what I did is I took photographs of my crochet pieces and then I painted them. And I painted them on cardboard and made sort of fake gilt cardboard frames. It was all a kind of a, a little poke at status and, and worth uh, and underscoring the fact that, you know, these paintings are actually worthless mm. because they were done on cardboard and with paper gold frames. So it was kind of an in-house joke for me. And so I had submitted a whole bunch of these paintings of, of very silly little, you know, they were really odd. And he loved them, absolutely loved them. And he exhibited them. And to this day, and, and actually he turned out to be quite a big supporter of mine. In fact, he's, he's reached out for me to exhibit some of my my clothing in a, in a gallery for free very soon. So I don't want to bad mouth him, but I just kind of want to... I want him to be aware of this mm. this bias mm. that I don't even think he was aware of at the time. That a, a work of crocheted, a 3D, 3D sculpture in crochet. Crochet was not seen as it's art not. because it was coming from a woman. Well, I know there's been in a lot of established galleries, there have been men who have been crocheting things mm. like taxidermy and things, you know, mm -hmm. and it's become quite the thing and it's seen as especially in sort of East End, London, Hoxton type areas, you know, it's been seen as quite subversive and quite quirky mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and very acceptable for men to do it. Mm -hmm. When, when women do it, yes. it's, it's it's seen as too close to the little woman sewing in the exactly. corner. Yes. It's seen as domestic and yes. just the craft, which is the lower, mm -hmm. you know, the little little sister of Big Brother art. Mm. Yeah. Well, that, that's really fascinating, and it perhaps brings us on to one of the women that I, I encountered when I was looking into this world, and her name was Mary Linwood, and she made pictures in embroidery. Mm -hmm. So she used slanting wool. She was called, they were called uh, worsted, worsted embroidery, mm -hmm. so they made of worsted wool. Mm -hmm. wool. Um, very intricate, and she, but what she did was she copied old masters, so that sort of puts her in a different category to start with. Yeah. Yeah. But she sort of sat between these two worlds of stitchery and and 
well, three worlds, really, stitchery, craft and art. By copying old masters, she was in there with, you know, seen as, as a good thing. Um, but because they were embroidery, they were seen as much lesser. And I always think if she had been uh, encouraged or allowed to make her own art, mm -hmm. uh, that would have been much more interesting. But she did have a degree of success. She had a gallery in Leicester Square and she had 64 works in, in there. And she was stitching up until she was about 80. So she had quite a good career. But at the very end, so the mid-19th century, it suddenly went out of favour and her works were worth nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like she was accepted for a while in, the, in this very niche world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not high art at all and it's yeah. not, she's not playing with the big boys, but she had a lot of... It's uh, maybe the novelty of it yes, as well. Yes, I think it, it know, was the novelty. Yes, and it's fun yes, and trendy yes. and then it dies and she away. Was, she was seen as skilled and, and um, talented, but not a genius. And I think that's the other thing about women in art. Um, being excluded from the world of high art is that for for years their uh, their gender has meant that they have no genius according to the people who are already in the world of high art mm -hmm. so yes you're a woman you, you don't have any genius so that's why you're not succeeding in high mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. um, it is a vicious so not capable of yes. having original thought. yes yes and yes. there were only a few women who who, who really succeeded in 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 the painting world, for instance, mm -hmm. um, there was a French woman called Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun who was who was very well celebrated. But she was only one woman, yeah. And she, I think she was the daughter of an artist herself, so she had mm -hmm. been she had grown up in the world of art. Extraordinary. Yes. So it's only for the but for the for the majority of women making art, it seems to have been just consigned to this world of craft, and that as Diane says, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's this danger with women doing using media that are associated with the craft of not it not mm -hmm. being art or actually just making a living making things mm -hmm. that's not art either mm -hmm. so yeah. we've well, all then, been to madame yeah. tussauds and, and, and unless i self-declared myself as an mm. artist i wouldn't fit yes. the criteria because i do make a living from selling what i yes. what i do i don't yes. necessarily exhibit in galleries or, and, and you may be starting to wear a wearable art. art so yes. it's, it's you know it's clothing mm -hmm. and it's really interesting because i paint as well mm -hmm. and i had somebody come around to view my work the other day who's an, a male artist and he really likes what i do and he was asking me how much i charged for the the clothing and i said a certain amount and he said oh, that's not very much and i said well that's as much as i can charge because it's clothing mm -hmm. and then he said well how much do you charge for your paintings and it was so easy for me to say a much bigger figure Mm -hmm. And he said, well, that was easy, wasn't it? I said, yes, because it's a painting. It goes on a wall. It has a, you sell by the, the square meterage, basically. Yes. It has this yes. very easy, um, it's very easy to put status onto a painting where it isn't easy to put status when it comes to art onto a piece of clothing. Yes, no. yes. No, a, a, a painting is on the wall away from us, whereas yeah, yeah. a and clothing I, is sticking to our and skin. And yet there's, there's the same, I mean, I paint on the clothing, so mm. there's the same amount of work that goes mm. into the clothing as there mm. is on canvas. I mean, anybody with a business head on, the, in the, you know, on their shoulders would probably say to me, stop doing what you're doing and just paint. Mm. Um, because, you know, I, can, I could, well, accept... I love what I do. So <laughs> yeah, I but it's all, isn't it also about exclusiveness? That if it is on someone's wall, yeah, it's there. It's for mm -hmm. that person or for the people who visit or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you wear something, it's actually it's like art in the public. Yeah, it is. It's like almost like graffiti. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of <laughs> yes. it's consigned to yeah, art for all. Yeah. But again, with paintings as well, they become, once the artist has painted the painting, it then becomes something else. It becomes a sort of investment and collateral, and it becomes something that you... Uh, it's an object, isn't it? Yeah, it becomes a thing separate, so it depends who collects it. Mm, and mm -hmm. if somebody important then collects that painting, then that then elevates the, the mm -hmm. price of the next painting that the artist paints. So it, it's almost removed from the, the, the talent... In the beginning, because then that, that painting takes on a life of its own, depending on what celebrity or what investor buys that piece. So then it takes on a whole new dynamic almost. 
that the artist has got nothing to do with. Yes, yes, it has a life of its own yeah. away from the artist. Yeah. Um, but is that in in the relationship to clothes? Do you do you think that's a that's a different? Yeah, because generally you don't sell your clothes on. No, you you, and especially with what I do with clothing, because it's so intensely personal. I create the mm. garment that is about the inner world of the person that's wearing that garment. So it would be like passing your embodied soul onto somebody else. You wouldn't do it. Mm. it no, that's sense. really such a personal. Yeah, well, it's a, a it's, portrait. It's a portrait. It? Yes. It's a portrait of your inner world in symbols, basically. So um, you wouldn't sell it onto somebody else, and mm. and. You know, it's not quite like second-hand clothing either. No, <laughs> like, no, 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 not it's sort of like second-hand thing. clothing. Yeah, really. so um. it inhabits this weird world. I don't mm. really know anybody else that's doing this, probably because they're not crazy enough. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I'm sort of walking this path that is uncharted, really. I don't really... Mm. No, but I, I think it is I mean, I, I, for you personally. You, yes, you're going on a, on, on a journey. You don't know what, yeah. what's at the other end. But it is a similar path to many other many other women female women artists, artists. Yeah. who have uh, m- come across these st- barriers mm-hmm. into into art, mm. um, and have had to divert into another mm. path. I trained as a painter yes. from the beginning. Um, but it was when I had children that mm-hmm. I realised I couldn't. I needed clear headspace and yes. total concentration to paint, and I knew I wasn't going to get that as soon mm-hmm. as I had my first child mm-hmm. because we all know it takes up your time. Well, exactly, and, and attention. Yes. And, and so I then started doing um, soft sculpture, where I was so little, funny little creatures and bodies and things, and so I could pick it up and put it down again. Mm-hmm. So then an idea for, for ideal being in the being house. In, so I could still keep my creative thing going mm-hmm. in the meantime while I waited until the children were old enough until I could mm-hmm. paint again. But strangely enough, I I did paint, but then I painted and then painted on clothes. I went back mm-hmm. to the sort of craft mm-hmm. aspect of it because mm-hmm. I found it very beautiful. Yes, and I think it's it, quite striking the women that I looked at who in history who, in in this broad period of the 18th century uh who didn't marry and didn't have children or married and didn't have children Mm -hmm. and so you know they they at that time having children was even more yeah time time consuming or or attention grabbing or whatever Mm. however you want to see it all encompassing Uh, all encompassing yes even with domestic help you Mm -hmm. know it was you would have so little time and so little daylight to um to do to do art. Oh, this is or, true. Or the practicality yes. of electricity. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, so some of these, a lot of these women, not only did they support themselves in the in the end, but also they they did not have a family life mm-hmm. because this is this is what they were doing. Mm-hmm. And choice. yes, and they a lot of them seemed. I mean, this is a generalisation, I'm sure, but they, they seemed content to live below below this dividing line of of high art and mm-hmm. and craft, for want of a better way of saying it, um, and just sort of stuck there. Do you think that has to do with expectations as well? Yeah. They could, because of low expectations, was, there mm-hmm. wasn't yes. that you I couldn't think aspire. No, and to be, you uh, couldn't have a studio if you were a woman. No. Yeah. You couldn't, you certainly couldn't have male assistants in that studio. No. You might, as as Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun did, I think she used her father's studio. Yeah. Um, but as a as a as an independent woman, it would be very difficult to, to have mm-hmm. a studio. You certainly couldn't do sculpture, mm-hmm. and you certainly couldn't see male bodies with no clothes on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was sort of out of it. So there you get um, people making these wax. Mm-hmm. Figures, you know, very very respectable wax figures mm-hmm. with their yeah. clothes on, but mm-hmm. um, and someone like Madame Tussaud who uh, had fantastic skill, and she put her energy into making these amazing figures in all sorts of circumstances. Yeah. Um, but she skill. also was a great businesswoman. Yes, I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, she was also an business. entrepreneur. That's oh, yes, wonderful. yes, and faced she she had a rather terrible husband, and um, she did have a couple of sons. But it was really her energy that went into making it a success, mm-hmm. and she was she was very imaginative. Um, but you know, there was no way she would ever enter the the world of high art. 
No, which is not to say she couldn't be a success at what she mm. did. But, mm. um, well, but women were excluded from live drawing studios as well, weren't yes, they? Yes, yes. No, you, you, as, of, you couldn't see male clients. Yeah, because the, or, the models generally were women of a certain age. Yes, yeah, no, you, wouldn't, you couldn't be, be in the same, <laughs> the same room as a, yes. as a woman like that yeah. and survive your, yeah. with your, with your reputation, reputation intact. Yeah. And reputation was all in those days, wasn't oh, it? Absolutely. Because Social standing. We, women, uh, you know, if if they were not the bottom of the heap, they they were uh, they had a value. They mm. were a, essentially a commodity from mm-hmm. marrying. And mm-hmm. if your reputation was Tarnished, ruined, you were you were no yes, longer a commodity. Which was, yes, yes. Yeah, so mm. I mean, they, mm. I'm sure they wouldn't even dream of even thinking about mm. sitting in a studio with. So them. that's that's where the whole embroidery thing came. Yes, yeah, so was sent home to sew. Well, yes, and, and a, a number of women felt very strongly that. Mary Wollstonecraft, for instance, that mm-hmm. women should not sew in a domestic, uh, even domestic sewing was mm-hmm. bad for women because number one, it took them away from reading books, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. also it um, it just made the, made their outlook so uh, so narrow yeah. and trivial, and when whereas they really should be thinking about broader broader things and right. sewing was too yeah. was almost too tiny so it, it's very interesting for me to see to talk to you about sewing things and i've i've seen i've seen those wonderful soft sculptures you mm-hmm. did years ago mm. um in the home doing mm. that and but but thinking about big issues and big things mm. at that time mm-hmm. uh, not not doing tiny little embroidery stitches mm-hmm. for no for no real reason yeah, um, I mean, yeah, the, the sort of sewing work that I do, it all has a political slant to it. I mean, mm. It's all infused with politics, often gender, mm-hmm. well, mostly gender mm-hmm. politics. Currently dealing with Brexit politics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so yeah, there's politics running all the way through. Yes. So it, it, I hopefully give it a little bit of an edge, I suppose. Um, but yes. I think that's that for me. That's kind of what, where I find the almost comfort in and in, in using the craft because if you infuse it with politics, it's like take notice of me. Yes. You know? yes. takes me seriously. Yes. This isn't just a decoration. This is a statement. This yes. is a um, an opinion. This is a, my voice as a woman, and I'm speaking because mm. I'm not going mm-hmm. to be shut up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. There, mm-hmm. there is a history of women stitching political yes, slogans. Yes, 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 yes. All, yeah. Those patchworks that are yeah. still being made, actually. I think mm-hmm. was, I saw one the other Green day. Common just, quotes yes, and, yes, like yes. That. Yep. and the suffragettes yes, as well. With yes. a, actually, I've, I've been asked to do a portrait of Green and Com- Common Woman as part of a project, oh, okay. which is rather beautiful, sort of, mm, yes. you know, full circle, which is really nice. Mm. I'm waiting for that to come in, but that should be fun. Yeah. This is, uh, let's have a look. Yeah, I think uh, we can nearly wrap up this interesting conversation. But there was another artist you wanted to speak about, was there not? Well, yes. Um, I, I was we... looking at a woman called Mary Delaney. Yes. Who was... Just briefly tell us a little bit about her because it seemed okay. relevant, I thought. Right. Well, she was a complete polymath. Uh, so she wrote a novel, she designed furniture, she painted, she spun wool, she made, did shell work, feather work, silhouettes. And she is the 18th century here. She, we, she was born in 1700. Okay, so early, early. Times. She's very early and yeah. she also did these amazing paper cutouts of flowers that are, there's a huge collection in the v and Mm-hmm. Um, they've all got black backgrounds on. I would encourage you to to visit the V&A website and have a look at them. Her name is Mary Delaney, D-E-L-A-N-Y. Mm. Um, she knew a lot about plants and botany. It was a real interest of hers. So she did these amazing cutouts made of layers and layers of paper. And she would... Was that like a more of a scientific type of uh, yes, it creativity? Yes, very, very, it, it was both artistic and mm. scientific mm. because mm. apparently the accuracy of these... these the botanical Yes, absolutely. Mm. And they are really beautiful. Um, and when we come to the stitchery, she did some panels for a dress. She must have done quite a lot more, but the survi- there are some surviving pieces of hers. And um, one in particular is 
panels for a dress and if you think of an 18th century dress it's sort of made in bits so there'd mm-hmm. be a sort of front mm-hmm. bit across mm-hmm. the petticoat mm-hmm. so she made all the bits of the dress using black silk and then a lot of really beautiful colorful embroidery mm-hmm. on it built up in layers um she probably didn't actually do the sewing herself she had a team to do that because it was very very skilled and an amateur couldn't really do it but she Mm -hmm. designed it and Mm -hmm. it looks just as stunning as these amazing paper cut Mm. pictures of botanicals and she was acknowledged in her time she Mm. was she was she was quite aristocratic okay so she was from an aristocratic family and uh but unfortunately not very wealthy so at the age of 17 she was married off to a 60 year old man uh, luckily (laughs) i'm going to say luckily he died seven years later she was very unhappy in the marriage um and then she was able to just be an independent person she didn't inherit his estate he didn't leave it to her so she sort of had to shift for herself but she had a lot of friends in London she knew Handel and Hester Thrale you know Samuel Johnson's Mm. friend and Jonathan Swift and a whole load of other people Mm. and eventually she married again she when she was about 43 she married um, a clergyman Patrick Delaney uh, an Irish clergyman and uh, they had a shared interest in horticulture so she was it sounds like she had a really happy time with him. Yeah. Uh, eventually, she, well, after he died, uh, Queen Charlotte again mm-hmm. patronised her and gave her a house in Windsor. So she had yes. a really good career. Yes. And she, if you go to St James's Church in Piccadilly in London, you'll see a little plaque to her memory there. So she's not forgotten. Mm. No. Um, so, yes, yeah, she, but she wasn't seen as, she wasn't up there with the Gainsboroughs. You know, she, no, she wasn't mm-hmm. up there with uh, constable anybody like that. Mm-hmm. No, you know, she made paper cuts and she did this and she did that. Yeah, she, her work was loved, but and she was seen as talented and highly skilled. Perhaps not mm. as a genius, but um, and again, I would she say she suffered her gender. Yeah, put her in a box. Yeah, mm. and I would say it's that novelty aspect mm, yes uh, and also that she did she did she clearly was very talented a mm. real creative mm. soul you know mm. force but actually so she did yes. many different things and whatever she put her hand yes. to she was and she, I mean, she made like diane she made wearable art mm. um in her case i think it wasn't seen as art at yeah. the time just it was just seen yeah. as a very beautiful thing yes. on a dress yes yeah. and yeah. she you know she was clever enough to get it mm. you know design it and get it made i think it's, it's quite interesting that when i do embroidery i have to do the inverted commas thing the embroidery i always do on the machine because mm. i couldn't possibly sit with a needle and just oh, embroider. No. i couldn't oh no but um it's the embroidered elements of what i do is normally um words mm-hmm. so it's normally sort of um, statements, political statements, or messages, or something, mm-hmm. like, which, which is really quite interesting. It's sort of putting the, you know, going from that sort of hand embroidered yes. flower thing, yes, and sort of well, less decoration circle. and more message, message, yes. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But and then, but then I still bring the paint back mm-hmm. by painting on on elements, and then mm-hmm. sort of sewing those back, painted mm-hmm. elements back into the clothes, so yes. mm-hmm. trying to sort of mix it all up. Well, I just love the way that you subvert all these mm. areas that are meant sort to be <laughs> sort of <laughs> low, yes. low, lower in status and you turn that round yeah. and make something that is is soaring really because uh, i encourage everyone to look at diane's website mm. where you can see examples of her work it is so vibrant and colorful and sh- shining mm. and uh strong unapologetic can be dark (laughs) yes it is it is it's it's really a fantastic thing to see thank you yeah and all the details will be uh uh, on our website yes and the website is called the doorpodcast.com so please visit us there you can see all the details and you can see a picture of diane Okay, so we're here at an exhibition in Loughborough Road in South London, uh, devoted to the work of Nellie Roberts. 
And Lily Roberts was born in 1872, and she became a really loved, well-received painter of orchids for the Royal Horticultural Society's Orchid Committee. Um, the exhibition is part of a wider project looking at all the businesses along Loughborough Road, and it has been put together by Tracy Gregory. Now, uh, Tracy, would you like to tell us a bit about Nelly and what it is about Nelly that you really sparked your imagination and prompted you to do this uh, exhibition of some of her work? Uh, I first heard about Nelly probably about two, maybe three years ago, and I'd already started looking at, at a bit about the history of the street because I was looking at the history of my house. So I was very interested to find out that uh, she was an orchid artist for the Royal Horticulture Society, but that she lived on Loughborough Road, uh, and I'd never heard of her before. And then I started with some of the neighbours doing a project on the history of the street, and so Nellie became, became quite a focus of that, particularly as we were looking at the shops and Nellie lived above one of the shops on the road, and uh, her father was a watchmaker. Yes, I think that's... Um, we were just talking about that, actually, um, the, fa the fact that her father was a watchmaker, dealing with very small, intricate things um, that required good eyesight and a steady hand. And there's Nellie, his daughter, doing these amazingly detailed, botanically accurate paintings of orchids for the committee which are still used as a standard against which other orchids now are compared. Um, so I think I can only see that connection between these, uh, the skill of her father and, and herself. How did she become an orchid painter for the committee? Uh, well, uh, the story goes, and this is written uh, sort of some years ago because nobody that's alive can remember meeting Nellie so it's sort of second hand but the story goes that uh, the son of a local orchid collector because at the time uh, collecting orchids was a, a passion of the wealthy and there was a local orchid grower who lived just off the Camberwell New Road which is not so far away from Luffer Road uh, and uh, his gardener was a member of the uh, RHS Orchid Committee and at the time they were looking for somebody to record the various orchid awards that they were making because they weren't recording them very well. And uh, the story goes that the son of the orchid collector walked past the shop and that one of Nellie's paintings was in her father's shop window and uh, he saw it and told the gardener and the gardener recommended her to the uh, orchid committee as a the potential. So she was taken on for a six month trial and then they took her on full time and she stayed for 56 years. That is amazing, isn't it? 56 years as an orchid painter mm -hmm. in the same house. She never moved from Loughborough Road and she, I gather, she made about seven, on average, seven orchid paintings in a month. So she was doing two, just under two of these amazingly detailed, accurate botanical records. Uh, each week, so uh, and just kept kept doing it in very cold conditions, and suffering from from arthritis and and chilblains, and, and just being a most amazing worker, um, recognised by her orchid committee at the time, obviously, but now remembered in a way that perhaps some of her colleagues on the orchid committee. Well, not quite colleagues, but the people she was working for are not remembered in the same way. She's left this fantastic record behind her in the archive of the RHS. Yes, and I don't think she's really known outside of the, the Orchid Committee and the RHS, quite possibly. Mm. Uh, so uh, it was just exciting for us to find her and be able to celebrate the work that she did yes. as part of the work we're doing on the street. Yeah, and, and it's something that is continuing because the uh, Orchid Committee still does employ artists to record their orchids. Yes. And we're lucky enough to be with Deborah Lamkin, who is the current artist for the Orchid Committee. Hi, Deborah. Hi. 
Um, I gather that uh, you have done over or, or, or close on 500 paintings yes. of orchids yes. for the committee. Yes. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how you set about doing that, how you set yourself up with the, with the orchid yeah. and start painting it? Yeah. Well, the way I paint an orchid is very much the same as the way Nellie would have painted an orchid when she started. I always use natural daylight, so Nellie would have done the same. Uh, I always will take the, well, nearly always I'll have the orchid flower in front of me and my page, and I will always work from life. Nellie wouldn't have had photography, I expect, so she would have worked just from looking at the orchid. So very much the same as what I do now. I do have the advantage of having a fridge where I can keep my oh, orchids, yes. <laughs> unlike poor Nellie. And like Tracy said, Nellie worked in a very cold flat, which I think was very ben was lucky for her. Yes, I mean, well, because it was it kept lucky her for the orchids. Yes, it? it was lucky for the orchids because it kept them fresh. Yes. Because in those days, they did award a lot more orchids than they award now. Nellie would have had, I know you said maybe something like two a week. I think it may have been two some weeks, but other weeks it may have Absolutely. been seven. Yes, that's ten. just an average. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and to, to paint in that way is extraordinary. She must have worked so hard. I think she wasn't doing yes. anything else, yes. really, other yes. than painting orchids. And yes. to have done that for 60 years and to... She has painted more than 4,500 mm -hmm. paintings for the Orchid Committee mm -hmm. and also a whole other set of paintings for the Northern... Northern England Orchid Society. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I think she did 200 paintings for them. Oh, fantastic. So she left a fantastic legacy. And it's very nice to see her celebrated in Absolutely. this way. Absolutely, see her work on the walls and, and to be remembered in, just yeah. across the road from where she lived, which yeah. is absolutely yeah. wonderful. When I, I've been looking at Nellie Roberts' paintings mm. for 15 years because I've been the orchid artist for mm -hmm. 15 years. I've never thought about her particularly until now. Mm -hmm. I, I thought about her in past. She really has, yes. the exhibition has really made her come to life. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it, just to see how she worked and to see some of her paintings exhibited, it feels very much like what I do when my work is exhibited. Mm -hmm. And it really, even though a hundred and however many years have passed, we are doing the same thing. Yes. Mm. Well, how wonderful that you can see her work on the walls here and uh, that we have you as, as her inheritor um, to talk about her. Thank you very and much. And that there will be many more in the future. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Long may the tradition absolutely. continue. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The, door. Door. The, door. the door. The door. The door. The door. You come to the end of our podcast. My name is Lena Augustenson and I'm the producer. And I am Naomi Clifford, history writer. All details of this episode are on our website, thedoorpodcast.com. You can also follow us on social media, on Facebook. On Twitter, we are at the Door Podcast. You can subscribe to us as well and uh, on any of the platforms that we're on. Just follow the links. You can also sign up for a newsletter on our website, which will tell you when the next episode drops. And yeah, I think that's it. That is it. Yes. yes.